Um, I just want to reflect really on 2018 and what's happened in the last 12 months. And because most of us involved in the movement have been going to all the marches, we've been engaging on social media, we've been talking to people, we've been doing videos and, and, and all the stuff that, that we do now in this movement, uh, we tend to lose track of what's actually happened in the last year. Well, not just the last year, the last 18 months. Because from our point of view, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people who've been doing this a lot longer than us. UKIP's been doing it a lot longer than us. Uh, people like Tommy and all his guys have been doing this a lot longer than us. But really the, the, the movement, as, as I see it, that really started after the terrorist attacks in 2017, which was really the core of it is Veterans Against Terrorism and the FLA, DFLA, and obviously now just the, just the DFLA, with the DFLA giving huge, huge numbers. And obviously with the veterans giving everything that the veterans bring to a, to a movement, which is, um, I suppose, some, some sort of credibility um, with, with the British public because of the great respect that, that veterans are held in. And then obviously last January we, we formed the UK Freedom Movement and the whole point of the UK Freedom Movement is really for everybody that's not a veteran, not a football lad, so that they can get involved and, and have a place and have a home a home to go to. And it really is um, a lobbying group and that's the, that's the point of the page. But going back to when the, the veterans first started, and I joined, I think, after Dan set it up, I think, in maybe May, end of May, and I joined uh, kind of June, July time and, and, and got myself um, heavily involved and uh, helped with you know, things like the website, the mission statement, that sort of thing, making speeches. But what we realised in the veterans back in September 2017 was that a street movement needs a political arm and actually and and this is where i would disagree with some of our, our political friends a political movement also needs um a street movement as well to to galvanize people to enthuse people for, for people to network and obviously for for people that are involved in the movement to see what's going on because these things always get out there on uh, on social media now and people can see even even if you do a fairly small event even if you do an event and there's maybe 5,000 people at it, which isn't huge. The impact that has when it's been shared on, on, on social media hundreds of thousands of times and the amount of people that reaches far outweighs the 5,000 people that go to the actual event itself. So going to the events is one small part of what um, of the effect that the, that the events actually have because once the events are videoed, they're uploaded to social media, the Facebook, YouTube. They far outweigh what they've done in terms of in terms of boots on the ground and people actually, um, people actually getting out and turning up to the event itself. So anyway, back in back in September last year, uh, myself and Sean and Dan s sat down, had a chat, and really from our experience in Northern Ireland and seeing what happens when a street movement doesn't have a political voice and where that can lead. Um, street movement, we decided to seek a political voice and a political angle. And we talked about um, starting our own party, realised that, well, we didn't have the time or the energy to do that, or the money, um, or the expertise. We also talked about Anne-Marie Waters, and for Britain, and we, we met Anne-Marie, um, and we chatted to Anne-Marie, about what we were doing and a lot of what she said was on exactly the same page as as we were on and, and I still have huge respect for Anne-Marie it's not the direction that we've gone in but I still have huge respect for her and I think that if everything completely collapses with UKIP which hopefully it won't I mean everything seems pretty good with UKIP but if if something really really bad happened or really malevolent happened we could we could always talk to Anne-Marie again but at the moment that's that's not on the table, I think, for anyone um, in the movement. While we can hopefully change UKIP um, into the image of something that will 
really accommodate the British working class because that's what our, our movement's about. It is a, a genuine grassroots street level movement. There's nobody pulling the strings of this. Uh, there's nobody controlling this. The people that are controlling it are literally football lads and veterans. It's as simple as that. Um, and that seems to be the case right the way across the movement. I want to mention Standing for Britain as well and, and Spence and the guys. Um, they've done a lot of work in the, um, in the background. Um, lots of other smaller groups that have been out there have done loads and, and, and loads of work. But anyway, so, so we, we, we talked to Anne-Marie and we also spoke to Gerard Batten because at the same time as we were thinking about getting a political voice, Gerard Batten saw the march that we took part in with the Football Lads Alliance as it was then in, in October last year. And there were 70,000 people, according to police, on the march. It was massive. It was a huge march. It brought London to a standstill. There wasn't any violence. It was perfectly marshaled, perfectly policed. We had a, the great privilege of having, I think, five veterans speaking on that platform. Some of them were, were retired police officers as well as veterans. Um, it was just an amazing, an amazingly powerful, powerful day. Um, so Gerard Batten saw that event, realised that we were serious about what we were doing, realised that we were committed to, to, to basically saving the UK from, from calamity. And Gerard reached out the hand of friendship and uh, took me and, 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 and John Meehan um, out to dinner and, and uh, Gerard paid, which, you know, I, I thought, well, that shows integrity. He didn't, he didn't leave us picking up the bill. Um, but we had a good meeting and that was where the alliance in, in, in U with UKIP was first talked about and first muted and things have progressed since then I mean at, at a sort of blistering place obviously there was a there was a whole issue within the the football lads and and as a result of those issues um the DFLA um was formed which to me was a great breakthrough even though it was painful and it caused a lot of people a lot of problems at the time the DFLA has a structure there where there is a, a genuine group of people who do make democratic decisions and they, they discuss things and they think things through and work things out before they take any, any course of action, which is, which is a lot better than just one man controlling a group. If one man controls a group, that can cause a problem. The veterans are exactly the same as well. The veterans have got a, um, a very, very strong admin team, which have done a fantastic job. Uh, we've got a leadership team. Now, the leadership and the admin team talk to each other and, and communicate with each other, so it's not a, um, a dictatorship. And that, that works well. I mean, we've got four guys on the leadership team and we've got, we've got probably about half a dozen guys on the, uh, on the admin team and we all try our best to talk through everything that we're going through. Sometimes decisions are made quickly and they have to be, they have to be made quickly. But on the whole, it works, works fairly well. The admin guys run the page and uh, the, the leadership guys work on, on strategy. So we don't really have anything to do with the day-to-day -day running of the page. So if you've got any problem with what's going on the day-to-day -day running of the page, don't give me any grief over it. So, so that's where we're at. We decided that we were going to join with UKIP. The DFLA, um, the veterans, met a very high-powered delegation from UKIP in the House of Lords. We met with Gerard Batten um, later on that day. We met with all the UKIP lords. That They gave us such, a, such a, a warm welcome. It was absolutely fantastic. And they knew what we were about. We weren't, we weren't hiding what we were about. We were concerned about terrorism, concerned obviously specifically about Islamic terrorism and, and the threat from jihadists, the threat from re returning jihadists, and also just the way that the, 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 the British working class people feel that they're being ignored by the state, that they don't have representation. And this is where I think UKIP can really clean up. If UKIP can actually get this vision of accommodating the working class and become... The, the, the political party of, of, of the British working class, irrespective of colour or, or re race, religion, irrespective of any of that, if you can, be, can become the party of the British working class, then they will achieve a very, very, um, a very, very great objective because the Labour Party surrendered that ground, the Conservative Party never had that ground, the Liberal Dems never had that ground. And, and this is something that UKIP can, can really feed into. And from my point of view, I mean, I'm only speaking for myself here, as long as UKIP go down that road, they stick to the policies that Gerard Batten's been looking at. They stick to, to going after the concerns that we're concerned about. Immigration, terrorism, 
uh, help for for the for the for the British working class, proper policing and, and law and order, all those sorts of things that are affecting our communities throughout the UK, not just not just in England but in Scotland, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, throughout the whole of the UK, and of course, as well as that, delivering a proper Brexit, because without a proper Brexit. None of this matters because we're not we're not making our own decisions, and and this this dreadful deal that Theresa May's put on the table um, makes things even worse. Then, of course, during two thousand and eighteen, we we'd done the deal, so to speak, with with UKIP. We'd started doing events together. Jared spoke on countless platforms with us, and um, things were going really, really well. Then the bombshell dropped. Um, and I think it was at the end of May. It was the end of May because it was just before my birthday. And Tommy Robinson was illegally imprisoned um, for contempt of court. He was he was grabbed for reporting. I mean, think about this. Where else would this happen in the so-called civilised world where a man is doing a report that's out in the public domain on the rape and sexual abuse of children by Muslim men, he's doing a report on that. He's the only one that's calling it what it is, which is Muslim on infidel rape. It's Muslim men raping girls who they class as infidels. Tommy's the only man that's reporting on it. He's dragged away into a police van and he disappears into, into the nick for, I think it was three, four months or whatever it was. Kangaroo court, he, he's locked up. Of course, that totally changed the dynamic of the movement. And a whole lot of people got involved in the movement um, to, to free Tommy, which I think was a fantastic movement. We all got involved in the marches. We had marches up in Belfast. We had marches in Leeds, marches in Manchester, as far as I know, marches in, um, in, in London. And all over the world, in fact, there was marches in Australia. I think they had some in Canada as well. So that really got a, got a huge amount of energy. And I'd been talking to Tommy before um, before this this happened about UKIP and explaining why we'd decided to make an alliance with UKIP. And obviously, me being a salesman, I don't know if he listened to me or not. I think Tommy makes his own mind up. But me being a salesman, I was I was constantly trying to pitch UKIP to him. Um, so anyway, Tommy Tommy was in jail, and um, while he was in jail, the two politicians that did most for him were two UKIP politicians, Jared Batten. And Lord Pearson, um, and I would say that uh, that's in the UK. I would say that the 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 fuss and the furore that that Lord Pearson and Jared made could well have saved Tommy's life because it seemed to me when 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 you look at this, and I'm not overly conspiratorial, but when you look at the jeopardy and the danger that Tommy seems to have been placed in while he was in prison, and I, and I spoke to him about this the other day because we were talking about the you know the fact that all of us involved in this movement the state is getting so oppressive and so totalitarian that all of us that are speaking out and taking a stand against islam may well find ourselves in prison and he said to me he said if you go to prison they'll kill you he says simple as that he says they will try and kill you and uh, uh and yeah so that's what's that's what's at stake here so tommy's put in in prison his life is in danger he loses all that weight he comes out of prison looking like he's been on hunger strike. I remember the hunger strikes in Northern Ireland in the 1980s and the pictures of the guys that were, that were on the hunger strike there. And when you look at Tommy when he came out of prison, he didn't look that different. Gaunt, traumatised. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely horrendous. But when he came out, it seems like while he was in prison, he made the decision and said, look, I will back UKIP. And that's what he's done. So Tommy is now going down a political road as well. Tommy has massive support. So when you put all these pieces of the jigsaw together and then you look at the fact that Brexit's been betrayed, that the immigration problem is getting worse and worse and worse, that the government are doing absolutely nothing about it, nothing about protecting uh, British culture and, and British civil life. Multiculturalism is still going on apace. Um, we're still having Islamic terror plots uncovered. We're still having Islamic terrorist attacks taking place on the continent. Four people shot two weeks ago. Um, Brexit is 100% being betrayed. Whether it's through absolute incompetence or whether it's malevolent, well, we'll let the history books judge that. But the reality of the situation is that the, the, the deal, that is no deal whatsoever, that is complete capitulation and surrender to the European Union, that that woman... That treacherous woman has done 
And Nigel Farage is right on this. It's, it's the worst deal in history. That deal should be galvanising the British people. And we, we've seen thousands of people on the streets and it's great to see that. I mean, there was, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of Remainers marching because they didn't like the result of the, the referendum. Because they, I remember going up to a couple and they had this badge on their, their lapel. I, I was at a veterans march and I had my one and only medal I got from Northern Ireland um, on, on my, my jacket. But this, um, this guy had, a, had a, a little badge at the same place where, where my medal was. And his badge said, bollocks to Brexit. And I just said to him, I said, are you not embarrassed wearing a badge saying bollocks to Brexit? I'm wearing a medal. One, only one medal, but it's still a medal that I earned for my service. I'm wearing a medal, and you're wearing a badge that says bollocks to Brexit. Are you not ashamed of yourself? And it went backwards and forwards. But that's the mentality of these people. Bollocks to Brexit should have read bollocks to democracy. Pathetic. And these were elderly people. These were people that should have known better. It was embarrassing. I was embarrassed for them. So anyway, the point is this vote has been betrayed. Now, if the Remainers can get tens of thousands of people on the streets to complain about a democratic vote and try and overturn it, well, I want to tell you something. Leave voters, we need to get out in the millions. And we need to surround Parliament. We need to surround Downing Street and sit there and stay there until they give us what we voted for. That's what we need to do next year. But all of this, this, this coming together of the street movement... And, the, and the, the, the political party in UKIP is such a positive thing. And as far as I know, it's never been done in England before. There's never been a mainstream political party, because UKIP is mainstream. There's never been a mainstream political party that has been wedded to a street movement. It's never happened. If, if, if I'm wrong on that, please, could someone come on and, and correct me? But I don't think it's ever happened. I don't think there's ever been a time in history when those two things have come together, a political party and, and a street movement. So what am I saying? Well, first of all, 2019, 2017, 2018 lay, have laid the groundwork for what's going to happen in 2019. Now, I think the first thing is, and this is for people in UKIP, and listen, I'm a member of UKIP, right? So if I'm speaking out of turn, I don't understand the full uh, machinations and how, how, how the political party works exactly. But I know the NEC are powerful, and obviously the, the MEPs are powerful, and most of those have resigned and disappeared now. But in 2019, I think... We need to focus, obviously, on Brexit. That needs to be the main focus of what we're doing. We need to make sure that we get a full Brexit and we get a Brexit delivered in a way that's meaningful and works for the country. So UKIP need to be on that from day one. We also need to be on an election footing. There's a possibility of a, of a general election coming up. And we also need to be making alliances with people. Now, Nigel Farage spat his dummy out and left UKIP. I think that was a big mistake by Nigel Farage. I understand why he says what he says and why he does what he does. I don't really think, I don't buy into this conspiracy, conspiracy theory that he's, a, that he's a, an establishment stooge. I think he just doesn't get a street movement. He doesn't, he's not working class. He pretends to be working class, but he's not. He doesn't understand us. So I can understand him walking away. But the way he slandered us in the street movement, called us tattooed thugs, look, no tattoos. And I was in the military. Most guys in the military do have tattoos. No tattoos. Um, so calling us tattooed thugs. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with tattoos. You know, everyone has tattoos these days. I'm actually in the minority. So that's how far out of touch Nigel is, right? Tattooed skinhead thugs. Yes, a lot of them are, a lot of us are skinheads. And uh, yeah, anyway, those insults that Farage levelled at the... Um, the people in our movement were absolutely disgraceful and despicable. And he's yet to apologise. He got it wrong. There was no violence from us. There was violence on that day. Absolutely. You called it right, Nigel. There was violence. But it wasn't from us. The violence came from the far left, who you were actually parroting and talking like a far leftist when you were saying the things that you said. And you should come to the movement and you should apologise. And what you must not do, Nigel Farage, a man who I hugely respect and still respect, you must not set up a party that is going to split the Brexit vote even further. All of these parties need to work together. UKIP, um, Leave, 
genuine Brexiteer Conservatives, genuine Brexiteer Labour people, the DUP, and Mr Farage, if you go and try and set up a, another party and 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 water down that Leave vote further, then maybe the people who are, who are talking about conspiracy theories are right. Maybe you are a stooge and a plant, and I've got you wrong. But if you set up another party, that's what you're going to be doing. So the point is, next year, whether we get... If we get a full Brexit, fantastic. We get exactly what we wanted. We leave, we crash out. I hope we crash out. I hope we go off the cliff. I hope the UK goes off that cliff to a no deal because the cliff has a very, very soft landing in World Trade Organization rules and it doesn't leave us tied in and locked into the European Union like Mrs May's deal does. And it doesn't leave us going for a second referendum like traitors like Anna Sauby and Amber Rudd and David Lammy want us to do. And by the way, Anna Sauby and Amber Rudd, People, you need to look into their constituencies and see how many, how many, what sort of a cushion they've got, and by how many votes they won the, um, the 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 last election. Because those people can electorally be toppled very, very easily. Some of these Romaniacs who have lead majorities in their constituencies and who are literally undermining democracy. If there's a general election, they need to be booted out. And UKIP can do that. And the, the, the voters in our movement can do it. So that's to UKIP. UKIP. UKIP need to focus on Brexit. But also UKIP need to welcome Tommy Robinson into the party. Tommy is a great asset to this movement. Tommy is a great asset to the party. He is not a perfect man. He is not messianic. And, and, and this is a problem with some of his supporters. Some of his supporters think he walks on water. He doesn't. And he would be the first man... To admit that, I've got to know him not very well, but fairly well over the last 18 months. And I respect him. He's an honourable man. He's a good man. Um, he's, he's a man that's got time for the people. And he is a genuine man of the people. And he is a working class hero. And he is extremely brave and courageous. Extremely brave and courageous. And he is an asset to any movement or political party so to me tommy needs to be welcomed into ukip i don't care how you do that i don't care what rules you have to change but get tommy in and get him in a position where he is able to stand politically and put his ideas to the electorate and see if the electorate think that what we believe about the major the the, the biggest threat to the to the uk is long term see if the electorate agree with me and agree with tommy and agree with jared batten that Islam is a very, very dangerous, dangerous force in the world. And as, as Jared says, it is indeed a death cult that wants to take over the world. Let's, let's test those things electorally and see how, see how that goes. So we need to get Tommy into, into UKIP and into the party. And if people on the NEC are uh, upset about me saying that, well, listen, there's nothing I can do about that. I know some people get upset when I make statements about what UKIP should do, me being a humble member and all. But to me... UKIP need Tommy in the party and they need him in the party as a matter of urgency. But of course, Brexit has to get sorted out first. We need this first three months of, of, of 2019 are going to be absolutely crucial to the future of this country. Our country is in... As, is, now, this isn't an over-exaggeration. Our country is in a similar jeopardy to what it was in 1940. OK, the people might not be coming across with swastikas and jackboots, but we've got people in our own government who are literally selling us out to a foreign power. That's treason. And those people need to be held to account for that. So UKIP has a crucial role to play in this. And we need to be telling people, all our friends, family, get out there and vote UKIP. In the Northern Ireland context, I think there needs to be some sort of a reaching out to the DUP. Um, because obviously the DUP are very soon going to realise that the Conservative Party have totally sold them out. And sold out everything they believe. Because one of the things about Brexit, and any unionist that is against Brexit needs to think about this. And this is why Republicans are so against Brexit. Brexit copper fastens the union between the UK and Northern Ireland forever. Doesn't matter what the Belfast Agreement says. Once we leave the European Union and, we, and Northern Ireland leaves with the rest of the UK, that copper fastens the union of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And it will also make Northern Ireland a very, very attractive place for people to come from the South to buy goods and services because 
We're going to be buying stuff cheaper. And that means we'll be able to sell stuff cheaper. Because we're not going to have the tariffs that the European Union impose on all of their member states, including the Republic of Ireland. So economically, there's advantages there. I'm digressing and going off on a tangent. So what about the movement then? What does the movement do in 2019? And again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dictate to anyone um, in this movement what they should do. All I can do is say, these are my thoughts on it. I mean, I can't get to, because I live in Northern Ireland, I can't get across the water to be with you guys all the time at every single demonstration. It's nearly bankrupted me. It's caused me all sorts of family issues. So I'm going to have to pick and choose what events I come to. But I support every single group in this movement that has the same agenda as I have. An independent, sovereign, united kingdom that is not scared to face up to the big issues that the globe is facing. And that, that literally says, we're full. We're not taking another million migrants in four years, another million Muslim migrants in four years. We're not going to do that anymore. And uh, so if you're standing on those issues, I'll, I'll stand with you. But what, do, what does the movement do in 2019? Well, I think if the Brexit betrayal happens, if they try to force a, a second referendum on us, if they try to ram through this dreadful deal that Theresa May's got, I think that we need to get a million people on the streets of London and we need to surround the Houses of Parliament, we need to surround Downing Street and we need to sit down in the road and not move until the politicians do the will of the 17.4 million people, the majority of people who voted in the referendum, who voted to leave. The government must deliver on that. If they don't, they are traitors. They're traitors to the country. They're traitors to the sovereign nation of the United Kingdom. And also, they are traitors to democracy. They are no longer Democrats. They have become a political elite that looks down on us, sneers at us, despises our views, and thinks we're too stupid to make our own decisions. I would love somebody on the Remain side to explain to me what is so great about staying in the European Union. What's so great about having open borders? What's so great about having an EU army that could well start a third world war with Russia? What's so great about oppressing people and stopping people's free speech? What's so great about censoring the internet? What's so great about taking money off hardworking taxpayers and paying it to those unelected technocrats in Europe? P paying it to that second-rate Luxembourg Prime Minister, to Donald Tusk, to Barnier and the whole lot of them. And that vile creature from the Netherlands that looks like he would... Well, I'm not even going to say it because I'm getting angry. Needless to say, I don't like the EU. And the sooner we get out of it, the better. The EU is a threat to the United Kingdom. It's trying to destroy the United Kingdom. And there's quizzling traitor politicians sitting on the Labour benches and sitting on the Conservative benches that are doing the same. And those Leave, the, the Leave politicians that have made such a cock up of it in the Tory party, they need to get a grip and they need to start standing up for Brexit in a real and meaningful way. Can't believe that Theresa May is still in power. It's absolutely disgraceful. I can't believe she ever got into power. And again, was it a conspiracy? I, I tend to think that most conspiracy theories are actually cock-ups that have been covered up. But that's what we need to do. We need to get boots on the ground. I, I, I had a little phrase I came up with last year. And, um, it, was, it was boots on the ground and boots to the ballot box. That's what we need to do in 2019. And everybody in our movement... I, I must admit, there's one group that really bugged the life out of me. And it's these absolute morons that they're, they're, they're totally conspiratorial um they've called me an mi5 agent they called me a police agent and an agent of the state and all sorts of things and they know who they are i'll not name them because i don't want to embarrass them um but those clampets that tell people not to vote who are you working for who are you working for if you don't want the people in this country to vote why don't you want them to vote because the only way that we can achieve anything is through voting. And if, if people are feeling betrayed by the Brexit vote being betrayed, 
We don't abandon democracy and we don't abandon voting. We double down on democracy and we make sure that we vote more. We vote more often and we, we vote tactically, we vote cleverly. Register to vote. That's, if you're not registered to vote, get yourself on the electoral roll for 2019. If you're in this movement and you're, and you're not registered to vote, you really, you've got to be. Because it's the only way that we can really change anything. When we start taking votes off these politicians, and I believe if if Brexit goes the way I think it's going to go, and if there's a general election foisted upon the country, I believe this could be UKIP's chance for a major breakthrough and to actually win seats off the Labour Party, win seats off the Conservative Romaniacs. This is what we've got to try for. This is what we've got to push for. So 2019 is going to be a crucial year. And you might think, well, what the heck are you doing on Christmas Eve going on about, uh, about Brexit and, and about the movement? Well, this movement is the most important political movement in the United Kingdom for probably over 100 years since the formation of the Labour Party. This movement is key to the future of our country, and we're not right-wing nutters. People in this movement are very, very left-wing. Not everybody agrees with me in this movement on my analysis of Islam, and that's fine. I don't agree with a lot of, a lot of other people on what they believe in the movement. But we can work together because we know, we know that this country is in trouble and that this country needs to be delivered from that trouble. And the first step, the first step on the road to the, to, to the salvation of the United Kingdom is getting a full Brexit, a full British Brexit, bacon and eggs and soda bread and all the rest of it so have a happy christmas i've had a mega rant there um i don't know if it made any sense i wasn't i wasn't thinking before i was speaking so um sometimes that's the best way to do it so have a great christmas and i'll see you all in the new year no doubt um i think we've really got to get ready for a mass demonstration if it looks like brexit's definitely going to get betrayed we need to get mega amounts of boots on the ground and we need to close that whole area around Whitehall and Parliament Square down. Close it down. And if we have to close it down for days, close it down for days. So have a, have a great Christmas, great New Year, and I'll see you all in 2019. God bless.